I am very excited today to have Dr. James Tabor with me. Um, Dr. Tabor is a, uh, well, I guess you're a retired professor, I see. Um, at, from yeah, the this, uh, of as of this month, or actually now we're in August last month, I, I retired July 1st after 33 years uh, teaching at UNC Charlotte. So. Well, congratulations on your retirement. That must be yeah, kind of For me, exciting. retirement means free time and more activity, not less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, good. And you have your, your PhD from the University of Chicago, um, which That's I true. should say that I like. I live in the Chicago suburbs. Uh, so um, I'm, I, I, I guess uh, you probably spent some, some of your years in Hyde Park. Um, I'm sort of... Oh, yeah. On the other end of the city, but uh, uh, I didn't I, live there, but uh, went there plenty because you know classes and meetings and so forth. So sure, um, and you are the author of multiple books. Um, we're going to be sort of talking mainly about the content of two books. There is Paul and Jesus, and then there is also Jesus or Paul's ascent into paradise. Um, and so the main focus of our conversation today will be. Yeah, I've sort got of, that one here. If you don't have it handy, great. Yeah. So I'll put I'll put links to, to those two in the description for um, this episode, so that people can find those. Um, and uh, Dr. Tabor is an expert on early Christianity. You're especially you've spent a lot of time studying the Dead Sea Scrolls and. Um, and uh, kind of early kind of Greco-Roman traditions and uh, all of that context in and around the New Testament. Um, but I would I would like to ask you just a little bit about sort of your your personal biography, um, sort of how you got interested in these subjects, and um, if you uh, growing up, what was religious life like in your upbringing, if you don't mind. Yeah, I grew up in the Churches of Christ, uh, the Candlelight Movement, or so-called Restoration Movement, 19th century movement, what is it, 1830s, I think, uh, mm -hmm. Martin Stone and Alexander Campbell. Uh, I think uh, Thomas broke off from Campbell, I think, and started the Christadelphians. Some of your people might know that tradition. Mm -hmm. Isn't it more Unitarian? Yeah, um, yeah. They have yeah. the, that, that's not my tradition, but it's the, they have a set, the same right. Christology. And of course, Campbell opposed him. He was also premillennial, and Campbell was all millennial and thought the church was the kingdom. And so there are a lot of differences. And, but I went to Abilene Christian College. It was called, now it's called Abilene Christian University, which really had a, a very fine biblical studies department. They called it Bible back then. And I majored in Greek of all things. Uh, so I took classical as well as Koine or New Testament Greek people call it today and Bible and history. And then for my master's, I went to Pepperdine, which is another Church of Christ school. But I was moving away from that in many ways. Uh, one of the issues that uh, just studying New Testament and early Christianity, the Jesus movement, historically led me toward uh, believing there was a more Aryan or Unitarian position initially. Uh, with the Ebionites particularly, they interested me a great deal. And what people call, I don't particularly like the term, but uh, Jewish Christianity or Judeo-Christianity. Unfortunately, today that tends to mean something like uh, Jews for Jesus or Messianic Judaism, you know, where people wear prayer shawls and, you know, dress mm -hmm. in kind of orthodox garb and use a lot of Hebrew and so forth. And I wasn't interested in that sort of thing, but I was interested in the movement around James, the brother of Jesus and the family of Jesus that I think was being marginalized to some degree uh, and uh, as history went on. So in graduate school, I began to gravitate toward that. And that was at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And University of Chicago, uh, was quite an experience. I suppose. The weather isn't quite as nice at University of Chicago as it is at Pepperdine, I think. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Malibu campus overlooks the ocean and the library has a huge picture window. So, anyway, uh, 
but I met, uh, I went to study with Robert Grant. He, he was a, a no longer living um, great church historian, one of the very greatest, if not certainly in the top five or so in the United States and even Europe. And uh, those who know church history will know Robert Grant. So I was awed and honored to just be around him. And then I began working with Norman Perrin on New Testament. He's a well-known kind of post boltmanian scholar who worked mostly on the Gospel of Mark. That's his, uh, you know, area of expertise. And then I met Jonathan Z. Smith, and I ended up writing my dissertation under Smith. And Smith is a historian of religions, broadly speaking, and his expertise would be more Hellenistic religions, religions of the ancient Mediterranean world. And to kind of start with an overview of the whole Mediterranean world from, say, Alexander on down, and what religiosity was like in that period. So with Smith, I finally had my whole bubble burst because I was very much, you know, coming from the Churches of Christ, focused on, you know, here's my Greek New Testament. You know, this is it, the Greek New Testament. That's what I work on. I'm a Bible scholar. And more and more, I became a historian of ancient Mediterranean religions so that I would be as interested in some of the Greco-Roman religions as well as the Jesus movement within its context. And also to even to view Judaism in the late Second Temple period say from the Maccabees down to the destruction of Jerusalem, the Maccabees like 165 BCE down to 70 CE, that very important period when so many things uh, began to develop. Pharisees, which now survive in what we know as rabbinic Judaism, the Jesus movement with all of its many manifestations into the even the second and third centuries, and, uh, of course, all the other religions. And so Smith, uh, you know, agreed to be my dissertation director. And I wrote on Paul, basically Paul's ascent to paradise, which is a quintessential Hellenistic thing to do, is to see the cosmos as the place from which you want to rise up and move beyond the aeons and the levels of heaven to this other world. And yet Paul also had a very Jewish grounding, what I would call a kind of Genesis 1 grounding, in that he still believed the creation, rather than being evil or negative, was positive. So, and not made by some other god. Other, other deity man. or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think Paul's Gnostic, and that's how I would generally define Gnosticism. But he did experience and express uh, a kind of Jewish form of Hellenistic relig religiosity in which you ask, uh, how do I go beyond this world of flesh and death, this lower world? He thought it was the lower world. It's the world of sin and death even though he accepts Hebrew Bible history or Old Testament history, you know, as part of his heritage as a Jew. And so it was a perfect combination to have Norman Perrin, Robert Grant for church history and so forth, and who was very Roman oriented. If any of your viewers want an excellent book on church history, in my view, it's the best. It's Robert Grant from Augustus to Constantine. I noticed the fact that he even brackets it with mm. two Roman emperors shows that he's very much in the Roman world. And it's such a thrill to read. It's a page turner. It's just wonderful. That and sounds good. I'll have to, I'll have to check that out. To Although I think out. from Augustus to Augustine might have been a more catchy title, but uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> too late, I guess. <laughs> Did I say August? Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> but no, that that's interesting. I've been doing a... Uh, well, that's my background. And now I'm, I'm very much of a historian of religions. I've continued to work on Paul with that second book on Paul, which goes all the way back to my dissertation. And so really, 
I'm, inter I'm interested in almost everything. I'm a historian. Historians, by definition, are interested in any period. But uh, my focus and my expertise is, you know, the biblical periods. So, mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I've been doing a Church Fathers series uh, with my Catholic friend, Hank. Um, and we've been doing sort of an episode or sometimes more than an episode kind of per church father um, going through. And so we're just getting up to Eusebius. And so one of the things that I've noticed in that is that their view of the cosmos, the shape of what we would call the universe and that sort of thing, and their assumptions about that are very different than ours. And like, at some sense, we know this, like there's perhaps a folk conception that, oh, they thought the world was flat back then. And then Columbus proved everybody wrong or something like that. But that's that's not exactly true. They didn't think the world was flat, but they didn't quite think of the solar system and the universe in the way that we do. And that it's not just like some side part that is disconnected from their theology, their cosmology, like our cosmology is almost completely spiritually empty, you could say, right? We don't have any spiritual significance to Jupiter or the sun or anything like that, right? It's just, it's the same kind of stuff that, that Earth is made out of, just maybe slightly right. different and further away right. or something like that. Um, and we can send people to the moon, we can send rovers to Mars, um, and theoretically, and we can send uh, satellites even outside of our solar system, um, you know, but it's all just material, it's all just kind of like this, except maybe a little different. But back then, the cosmos that they imagined was not only structured very differently, it was also spiritually animated and loaded with theological significance, both for pagans and Christians and Jews alike. And this was one of those things where it took me a couple times to like kind of wrap my head around what they how they really imagined this. I would say the ascension of Isaiah, the second half of it, at least, if anyone wants to have their mind completely blown open as to what they actually thought, uh, the ascension of Isaiah is probably one of the clearest examples of the interconnection between cosmology and spirituality. And it's sort of a second century Christian Jewish sort of document that is uh, relevant. So my first question for you is, what did the Apostle Paul think the cosmos was like? And how did that affect his view of you know, theology and all those sorts of things? Right. Okay. It's absolutely key. And uh, the, the main word, I think, would be escape. The idea that uh, there's a lower material world and the lowest level of it would even be the underworld, the world of the dead, the Chthonian world called Hades in Greek, Shio in Hebrew. And then as you move to the level we're on, the living level on the earth, you're still very much in the world of the flesh, as Paul would call it. And you're not immortal. And yet the air which is the first level as you move up towards the moon, which is the first celestial body, uh, is just thick with uh, living beings, uh, all kinds of... Now, Paul has a more Judaized view of it, or a view coming more from the Hebrew Bible and from Hellenistic Judaism. It would be closer maybe to Philo or somebody like that of the time. But it is very similar to Plato in many ways. So even though... You know, we think of, well, Plato, he's not really reflecting Christian ideas. The cosmology isn't any different. I know they're flat earthers today. <laughs> I, I see them on YouTube. But <laughs> the, the description you just gave is universally accepted by most Christians today. And as they look up at the cosmos, they don't see anything particularly threatening. If anything, which is actually very unscientific because it's kind of scary out there in the solar system. You know, all kinds of galaxies and untold billions and billions of uh, bodies and changes and so forth. I mean, it's very violent. And just look at the moon and the craters on the moon. Our Earth apparently has that same kind of uh, history, but it's been covered over by life on Earth and looks like a blue-green orb now, kind of beautiful from a distance. 
So that isn't the way anybody in the ancient world viewed it. Uh, you could go from the ancient Near East all the way to, through the Mediterranean world. There was a pretty unified cosmology. And it had to do with uh, the earth being the lower level, the material level. And it's a it's a sphere, right? It's the, sphere, these are right. these yeah. levels are sort of like concentric right. spheres. In this book, uh, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, it uh, actually surveys. I don't know how far you got in it, but there's a section. I think it's this chapter two which goes through a lot of these other texts before we get to Paul. And so it uh, surveys ascent to heaven in the Hellenistic world and, and Ascension of Isaiah is one of the texts and there are others that I cover, but it, but I began way back with Plato and the kinds of things that he talks about and Cicero and all kinds of Hellenistic writers of, of the general period. As you move up, then, it, it rather than being neutral or just masses and chunks of rock or something like that, as we tend to think of our planets, and the sun is one of the, the planets as you go up, uh, you begin to have these seven planetary spheres, they're called. And these would be, think of it as rings of reality as you go up and up and up. So it's circles moving up like this. And in the Hellenistic view, they're all populated by what Paul calls angels and principalities and powers. And that's why he says heights and depths. This is in Romans 8, when he, he kind of runs you through the cosmos and says, who will ever defeat us? You know, no matter what level, whether you're talking about the lower level, where you're going to have, in some ways, even mischievous powers that might just give you a flat tire or bring bad luck or something like that. Right. I think most modern Christians read heights and depths as like, ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low to keep me from That's getting right. you sort of thing. Absolutely right. not. Yeah. Depths, <laughs> yeah. of course, goes all the way down to the lower world. Right. And heights would be the highest level of mm. heaven. Seventh heaven, we even say today, you know, yeah. somebody being in seventh heaven. So... In our language, that has been preserved by saying seventh heaven. Mm -hmm. And I do argue in the book that when Paul does allude to this more specifically and talks about third heaven, paradise, and so forth, let's save that till later when we talk mm -hmm. about his ascent. But he does indicate that that it's this mo that he has this uh, experience of a static ascent in the body, out of the body, he says he doesn't know. He was taken up. And I always want to point out to people, even though I survey all of these ascent traditions from antiquity, from this Hellenistic period, Paul is the only first person testimony. Mm -hmm. So if you think of books like Enoch, which would certainly be among Jews the most well-known, it's even quoted in the New Testament in the book of Jude. So it's known to Christians, uh, of, of that period of the first century, and they use it and read it, apparently, probably think Enoch wrote it. But historians today would never think that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, wrote that account of his ascent to paradise. Prior Plus, to the flood. And, yeah, right. it was and what somehow, we call yeah. first Enoch is actually a set of, uh, it's a cl collection of books that date from various times and so forth. So it's not a first person account. We don't have any first person's account first person accounts where somebody says and it's an identifiable figure with their own writing this happened to me i did this mm -hmm. now we do have people writing in the first person in the name of a fictional character be it isaiah or abraham or enoch exactly. or who have what have but we don't you know nobody but i think even the most critical scholars even the mythicists would say no paul in 2 Corinthians 12, probably wrote that the Paul, the figure Paul, uh, he's not doubted as having existed, generally speaking, even if people, some people don't think Jesus existed. So we've got a really interesting case where the only first person testimony from all over the ancient world is a guy named Paul who says, yeah, I, I did have that experience. 
but he's reflecting something common and his vocabulary and his description of it is common. At the I, lower I, level, I guess I have I have a slight side yeah. question. Would you consider sure. the book the the John who wrote the book of Revelation? I guess maybe he is writing down Jesus's ascent. Um, but uh, but well, it's he not says here. he was. But the point is, he's not a identifiable historical character. Sure, uh, he might have been, but certainly not the apostle Zebedee. So, so whichever Zebedee. whichever John we call we we assign this identity to, or even if we just say we did, we have no idea of which John this is talking about. He is describing a revelation that he gets back from yeah. Jesus of Jesus's own ascent, which is, I think, and, something no, that he people... also says his own, his own ascent. He says, I was told, come up hither, and he goes up. Mm -hmm. But remember, that could be a literary account. Paul's is not a literary account. You see the difference I'm making? In the book of Revelation, of course, the author, who uses the name John, says he's John, does say that he was caught up into heaven and he saw this and he saw that and he uses I throughout. So in that sense, it is a first person account. But the difference I would make in kind of maintaining my position that Paul is the only identifiable first person account is we don't know exactly who that John was. And secondly, it does have more of a literary character to it mm -hmm. so that it reminds you of books like Daniel or even uh, First Enoch and some of the other materials you've mentioned, the Ascension of Isaiah. So in that sense, I still think Paul stands out. He's an identifiable author. We can date it within a few years. Uh, we can place it in its uh, context and so forth. So he becomes very valuable uh, in the sense that he's telling us this kind of thing was practiced or experienced in his own time. And I think that's what I was building on. Sure. So um, what what is the what is third heaven or where is third heaven? And why would going there give you access to information that you didn't have here? Yeah, the, the third heaven and paradise are the two terms that come out in his account. If you want to go to his account, I think I have it printed out here, maybe even in Greek. Let me just pull this out where I can talk about it. I won't read it in Greek, but just to make it in more detail. Um, he dates it 14 years ago from wherever he's writing. Uh, I don't think it works out, by the way, to be his conversion experience. It's not the road to it's not the road to I, the I don't think it is. I, I almost would like it to be, but the chronology is really tough. But Paul, you know, the reason people have suggested that sometimes is he talks about in Galatians 1, a 14-year period about mm -hmm. having an experience and then waiting 14, three years and then 14 years. Of course, we don't know if that's 17 altogether, if it's three years and then 14 after the initial. And if that's the case, other, like John Knox, the a New Testament scholar, not the ancient, not the older John Knox, but current, uh, he had suggested that. And then I think he backed off later with all the criticisms. Uh, but I will say this, I'm open to that idea, because when we do chronology of Paul, we almost have to go to the book of Acts. And a lot of critical scholars don't feel that Acts is on the same historical level as dealing with one of Paul's letters. But either way, it's something he remembers very well. So just to point that out. So what he says is that he was caught up uh, into the third heaven. And then he says, he even was, though he's he's speaking about a man, it's pretty man. universally universally understood to be he's talking in the third person about himself, yeah. perhaps it, for the purpose he, of humility or something. Yeah, it's a rhetorical device that we know also in Greek. In my book, Paul's Ascent to Paradise, I give other parallels. It's absolutely Paul for sure, because he then goes 
on to talk about to keep me from being too <laughs> exalted by this amazing, he uses the term uh, who pair, you know, like we say, uh, extraordinary revelation. Mm -hmm. It's not just a revelation, it's a way beyond who pair means way beyond anything. It's, it's the ultimate, you mm -hmm. know, to get to ascend to heaven. And so uh, even though sometimes you'll find that paradise can be located in the third heaven, I argue that this is a two-stage journey. And I don't want to go over the reasons for that here, but if you can just accept that, that paradise is actually then the highest heaven. It's Which going beyond the seventh, seventh heaven. heaven. Or even the, beyond seven the unbounded super celestial realm. that's right yeah. and that's yeah. of course the dwelling of god in the throne of god where he believed jesus uh the human jesus has been exalted into a life-giving spirit which i know we're going to get into later what that means and his metaphor is that he's sitting at the right hand of god so he's go he's gone up all the way not just to the th third heaven but all the way and paul has this experience so i uh, the i think paul is accepting these levels um he's more bothered with the lower levels because that's where humans have to deal in their everyday lives like if he's making a trip or planning to do this or that he often will say things like uh, satan hindered me I, I intended to do this but I wasn't allowed to or I was blocked or something when he has somebody expel from the community in first Corinthians five, he talks about delivering them to Satan. So the idea would be Satan has this realm. Paul calls him in Galatians, the God of this world. Yeah. But the world is this lower cosmos. Right. And the prince of the power, world. the prince of the power of the air like That's Satan right. is sort of like his natural abode is sort of in the atmosphere, the the gaseous atmosphere around Earth, right? That's true. And and there's sort of like uh, you see it in the Ascension of Isaiah that there's sort of like a prince angel at each of the right. the levels of the spheres, and that Satan then would be yeah. the angel that was in charge of our sphere, and yeah, he resides in the air, but he's in some state of rebellion and um, evil. Something that, of that yeah. nature, whether it's the whole kind of dispensationalist view of, you know, Lucifer, so-called in Isaiah 14 and rebellion in heaven and all that. But he probably has some idea like that. Yeah, some sort of Enochic kind of. That's right. Uh, yeah. But there are, he does call in this passage, uh, which is 2 Corinthians 12, where he recounts this, he talks about a, it's usually translated um, angel of Satan, maybe. I'm not sure about the old King James. I can't remember. But maybe messenger would be better. But it is mm -hmm. angelos, uh, a messenger of Satan. Well, that would be like a demonic power, what, what we would call a demonic power in the Bible, at least. It's demon tends to be an evil spirit. So there are various spirits, but evil spirits are malevolent and they want to get you and stop you and oppose you and so forth. That's all the way through Paul's letters where he, he does have that um, kind of idea. Uh, and that can be, but even going up, is fraught with dangers, at least according to these other texts that I survey in general about the culture. Because as you go up through these, their guardians, really, they're going to ask you, uh, what are you doing here? And you're a mere mortal. And mm -hmm. how did you get here? And what author is, it's almost like you have a pass or something, right? Yeah. you know, to get through where you have to, and that gives rise to all kinds of magical things and chance and all kinds of uh yeah and in eastern and... in eastern orthodoxy there's sort of this is not officially recognized as their uh afterlife but it's sort of like a common folk belief that there mm. are toll houses yeah and your soul has like 40 days to get to heaven 
and there are these toll houses where you have to stop along the way and they're sort of like representative of the different categories of sin or something and you know it might help to know the password or to have yeah, overcome right. that particular category of sin in this life so that you won't be hindered on your soul's ascent to heaven sure. I, I know that some some eastern orthodox are all about that some eastern orthodox people are like no that's a wives tale that's not what we actually believe yeah, but, exactly. but but that sort of idea still lingers around either that, way it's coming from this ancient culture culture and right, right. it's down on the level of folklore at that point but it's still passed on yeah. of course paul and we'll get to this i know but he did not think that when you die your soul goes up through mm -hmm. and that gets to the idea of resurrection at the end of the age and so forth which is a totally different idea but he still lives within this Hell hellenistic world and he assumes that it's the case and so probably that list that he gives of heights and depths, angels, principalities, powers, and he's very inclusive there. He says, or anything else in all the cosmos, mm -hmm. things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth is the typical way that you talk about it. But notice when you say things in heaven, things on earth, things under the earth, those are entities those are forces those are powers mm -hmm. so it's a it's a very magical mysterious world and i'm using magic in the sense of the ancient hellenistic idea that the cosmos is just thick with these entities and you've got to know what you're doing and they also can afflict you as he says a messenger from satan came and began to afflict him it uh, sounds almost like some kind of a bodily ailment, and people talk about his, calls it a thorn in the flesh, which is worse than a burr under your saddle or a rock mm -hmm. in your shoe. I mean, a thorn pierces you. So it's not something like, oh, that kind of hurts. I need to stop and get the rock out of my shoe. No, this is the nail in your foot. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you don't need to stop. You stop when that hits. And so he, something is uh, attacking him. And again, many speculations on, you know, Paul's physical ailments. And we, we could get into that too, but let's uh, stay with the cosmos uh, for now. Sure. Yeah. I, although, Bri, I, I do have to ask, I, I've heard you okay. say that you, you, your favorite um, idea for the thorn in the flesh is that Paul dealt with a um, sort of a unovercomable sexual temptation that, that kept bothering him. Um, yeah, this is just uh, my guess based on... Uh, what he says in Romans 7, where he's struggling with what he calls the flesh. And even though he believes he's fully redeemed in Christ, he begins Romans 8, which follows this little passage. There's no condemnation for those that are in Christ. So, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how he ends Romans 8. Who can accuse us? Who, you know, who can conquer us? But in Romans 7, he says, the good that I would do, I do not, and the evil that I would not, I do. I just don't think he's talking about lying and stealing, and because he talks about, I was raised blameless under the law. You know, he seems to be very resolute about wanting to be a just and upright character. But uh, then he mentions coveting, which is this old English word, word but it really means lust. And particularly, you know, don't covet your fellow person, your neighbor, you know, your neighbor's wife or anything your neighbor has. But uh, to lust after, it's a pretty strong word uh, to intensely desire something. So I've speculated, but I'm perfectly okay with some of the physical things people have celeb. They've guessed uh, epilepsy. Uh, they've guessed... Uh, a Partial lingering mind. a lingering injury from one of his stonings. Uh, yeah, it could be know. disfiguration, uh, blindness. There's some evidence uh, hinted at here and there, particularly in Galatians. He talks about a bodily affliction that he had that they put up with, and they regarded him as an angel of God rather than something despicable. You know, even though he seems to say my my condition could have been a burden to you but you didn't you saw it as positive 
So I, I could go with that too, but I, I wonder whether he might be experiencing something similar to what we know from ascetic saints and monks throughout history that are perfectly okay with don't lie, don't steal, don't cheat, really regulate your ethical behavior, but they have a lot of trouble maybe with dreams Mm. particularly or with or like saint anthony's seeing uh the vision of beautiful women when he's in the desert yeah that he interprets right. as demons coming in the form of beautiful women to excite right. his lust and stuff like so that. it could be something like that and uh he said he asked three times uh and here you see another thing that i emphasize a lot in my work is the intimate relationship paul claims to have with jesus that literally reminds you of the old evangelical hymn, let's have a little talk with Jesus. You know, it's not just like praying to this majestic presence that is so unapproachable, but he, he just says, I asked the Lord three times. Mm -hmm. I mean, that sounds really definite. Like you say, uh, Jesus, you know, it reminds me of um, Robert Duvall and the Apostle. I really recommend that <laughs> film. Uh, because he's like that. He goes, now, Jesus, you and I have been friends for a long time, and I've tried to do, you know, and Robert Duvall's talking, he plays that apostle. Right. And Paul's uh, been to heaven with Jesus. He's right? been to heaven. He's seen things yeah. unutterable. Yeah. So uh, he, uh, it shows that he hears, he believes that he hears from Jesus, but not just some grand message, like he said, he received his gospel, he calls it, from jesus a revelation of jesus christ and some people read that that's galatians 1 a revelation about christ well of course it was about christ that's that's a moot point but he's not talking about what it was about there he's talking about the source of it i didn't get it from james from peter from any of the apostles but i got it from jesus himself mm -hmm. so not only can he get a kind of insider content into his message but he can also get uh, a sense of uh you know something practical like that like this temptation is really dogging me and could you remove it because right. it's a his it's a two-way street right jesus yeah. has given him revelation from heaven but he feels like he has some authority and ability to ask him personally to you know take away this thorn in the flesh too that's right mm -hmm. so. Um, okay so, so, I'll so, let now, you guide me here. so now i guess we should talk about and and i guess what one sort of other important thing about i think cosmology is that this idea that the lower is corrupt it's um less it, it it goes away quickly right things don't last very long down here but the higher up you go the more eternal something is right like and when he in first corinthians when he's talking about you know heavenly bodies he you know the stars don't change right you know the sun and That's the right. moon and the stars don't seem to be any different from day to day right they've looked the same as far as the the ancient people knew for as long That's as right. humans have have looked at them so things don't change as much in the heavens as they do down here and so in some sense they're closer to god they're you might even say of a higher level of divinity or something like that That's right. And, and that the problem really is that in the down here place, it, it's not like that. And that this is really the trap and the conundrum that humans find themselves in is this world of corruption and decay. And that's sort of what Paul thinks of as kind of the central problem of our predicament that God is trying to solve through Jesus. Right. And he, it's very important to understand. Uh, first, let me go to uh second corinthians chapter four the last couple of verses where you could read that in an isolated way and you could even think plato wrote it mm -hmm. where he says we look to the things above not to the things below the things above are eternal the things below are moral or temporal and so forth so that's just a common hellenistic view but the difference with paul and this is really critical is he thinks, and this is from Romans 8, that the entire cosmos 
he says, is in bondage to decay, but that it's done by the will of God. So this temporal level that we're on was not a fall or a surprise to God like it is in some of the Gnostic traditions where the higher God is like, oh, no, now what shall we do? Mm -hmm. You know, the beings of light have fallen into the world of darkness. I've got to figure out a rescue mission to get them out. He doesn't have any view like that. So this is going to distinguish him from his Jewish background in the Hebrew Bible. Like if Paul read Genesis 1, where the world is good, 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 I think seven times, and at the end it's very good, he's affirming that. That would not generally be the case with anybody from Plato, in some ways all the way down to Augustine, although Augustine does keep some of that idea because he wants also to st keep his feet in the, the idea of God as the good creator because he was a Manichaean. Mm -hmm. And of course, Manny had that other view and now he has converted to the positive view. So I wouldn't put him wholly within that um, platonic or Hellenistic dualistic camp. So Paul lives in that world, but he interprets it differently. And he sees it as a matter of this age and the age to come. So in this age, God purposely created a world that is temporal, that is passing, that is lower, that is a world of death and a world of sin because of a plan that he has to bring out of that what he calls a second race or genus. Race is kind of a bad word today. So it's a, if you think of species, a, a sort of new uh, kind of human being, which would be the spiritual atoms. So the first atoms, A-D-A-M, are of the flesh, temporal, but that's by God's will. And even the creation itself, he says, is in bondage to this lower level, mm -hmm. but by God's will. And he says he did that in hope that the creation itself would be set free. And as he puts it, obtain the glorious liberty of the children of God. And these are these glorified beings that are going to escape completely from these spheres, from this lower realm, into a what people call a new creation, a whole mm -hmm. new creation. So you've got new atoms, new humans, glorified with new bodies in a new creation that is that is almost like this is a temporary model. I like to even use the term like a mock-up of what's to yeah. come, you know. Like the uh, blueprint compared to the building. Yeah, yeah, to the building, exactly. And I think mm -hmm. he thinks like that. Yeah. And that's a, that's a critical difference because even though he's at the lower level and knows that all of us have to deal with these different powers, principalities and powers and so forth, he, he thinks that this is purpose by God. And uh, even the crucifixion, he says that uh, what was really going on here was hidden from these powers. This is in 1 Corinthians 2, or they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. Like if they had known by killing the Messiah, you're going to create the firstborn of this new race or genus or species of beings, you know, they were tricked in a way. Mm. Uh, they wouldn't, they would go, oh, well, we're not going to do that then. Uh, yeah. So, you know, he, he believes that all of this was uh, orchestrated by God. And God sort of fooled the powers by by bringing about this. Right. He caused them to do what he knew that they would do, would but do. they didn't realize what they were doing. They and were sort doing. of uh, in a what you meant for evil, God meant for good kind of tricky kind of way. Yeah, because the glorification that's so important to Paul, and as you know, I have a chapter in Paul and Jesus, and I call it Paul's greatest idea, is that not only the cosmos will get transformed, but this new genus of beings will emerge that are the children of God, and they will be immortal and even above angels. Mm -hmm. So he actually 
believes that God has a plan to take these worms, these caterpillars, and transform them eventually into the highest level of creation. That would be his own sons and daughters, you might say, although right. uh, gender is not really, I think, operative in his Yeah, mind. do you think that, uh, quick question, do you think that he envisions the, this sort of future glorified human race to be androgynous, basically? Uh, or just beyond gender, whatever. Just beyond gender, yeah. <laughs> androgynous could even mean both, but mm -hmm. whatever the nature of God is. And he's going back there to Genesis 1.26, where humans let us make humans in our image, in our likeness. And then it says male and female created he, him, or them. You know, mm -hmm. the him and the them both get used there. So he thinks of God as having the dual nature. And there he's dealing with an ancient problem all the way back to Plato, is when the souls of light fell into the world of darkness and the best text on that would be something like Poimandris that I cover in my book. It's a Hermetica text. Very, you know, it has the logos and it has the light beings falling down. But they get split up by sexuality. And that's all going to get unified again into one whole. And that's characteristic of all forms of Gnosticism. But see, with Paul, it's not really that idea. He has to address that idea. Why do we have genders? Why do we have gender and death? It's sex and death mm -hmm. that are kind of the, you know, the human problem. We're terminal and then we pass on ourselves to these other offspring. Is that just an endless process? Like, what is the outcome of that? What is the meaning? It seems so futile. Well, if you're channeling souls up into the world of light, that's the process. You know, death actually in the Hellenistic world was sometimes referred to as birth. And people would say that when you die, you're being born into, you know, your full spiritual quality. Paul would say, no, death is an enemy. Mm -hmm. But it's been defeated, you see, by people say the resurrection of Jesus. But I think a better term is the transformation the metamorphosis of jesus because yeah. resurrection just means to stand up and it if you mean the resuscitation of a dead body that's not at all what paul means even though christians mm -hmm. today apologetically want very much to have that corpse moving around and walking around and breathing and showing its body talked a lot about that in my book as well and that is a paul's idea um, before we get too much into the yeah. resurrection, can we talk about how does the crucifixion solve this problem for Paul? What, what, how, how, what? That doesn't entirely make obvious sense on first pass. Why uh, a person getting crucified would be able to defeat the powers and principalities and bring about the initiation of this new creation? How, how does Paul imagine that doing the trick? It's. Uh... It's the corollary that goes with the glorification. And as he says again, Romans 8 is the key chapter to really study on all the things we've talked about so far with other verses brought in to explain. Uh, we will be glorified with him, provided that we suffer with him. And so the giving up of the body of flesh on a kind of daily basis where he says we... Uh, I die daily, I crucify the flesh, it becomes, in a sense, an ethical metaphor for putting to death the flesh, you know, the desires of the flesh. So he says in Galatians, you think almost like an arm wrestling thing, the flesh lusts against the spirit, that's the word lust again, and the spirit lusts against the flesh, and you cannot do what you would. But that struggle is what can bring redemption. And he does say, provided that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified with him. So it's not a life of ease. It's a life of struggle with your own internal self, with dealing with other people. For example, when he's solving the divisions in the Corinthian church, which are apparently very bitter in, in ways, 
dividing up and maybe not even mm -hmm. fellowshipping or associating with people in the group. Uh, he talks about uh, why not a, why not bear abuse? You know, mm -hmm. what if you are wronged? So what? You know, uh, Jesus was wronged. You know, being wronged or being misunderstood or being mistreated is part of the human experience of learning love. And so uh, for him, the way you learn love is to be in the arena of this kind of uh, temptation and conflict in every aspect of what human life offers, challenges. And, and that, you know, how many times do people say, and any of us above 20 know this, life is hard. It really is. And it's tough, you know, and very few, some people can cushion it with money or with different kinds of environmental, you know, privileges that they have, uh, race, culture, status in the society. But in the end, everybody knows it's really hard. And mm -hmm. certainly in the ancient world, that would be even more the case. And you that know? suffering is an opportunity for sort of overcoming that suffering and thereby strengthening the spirit over and against the flesh and that like christ's crucifixion is sort of the ultimate example of that or something like Father, that it's forgive like, them yeah. they know not what they do rather than cursing and reviling your enemies which she so he for example says um well let me tell you something my my teacher norman parent said because he was a boltmanian and post Boltmanian, the post Boltmanians argue that we can recover some historicity from the Gospels. Hans Kozelman was one of his first students to say, "No, don't give up the quest for historical Jesus. We, you know, there's still something that can be found." So I remember Perrin once in class at Chicago. I like passing on this story. Somebody asked him. It wasn't me, but somebody. I wish I'd thought of it. Uh, Professor Perrin, if Jesus had been drugged to the cross, historically, kicking and screaming and cursing his enemies, could the cross still work for you in your kind of Boltmanian philosophy and theology, which talks about the cross in much less than just a literal way? And he, sa he said, uh, that would be a problem. <laughs> so he realized that even as you, know, you can mythologize Jesus, but if he's, if he's a bad guy, if he's a horrible, despicable guy, and you're making him the good guy, then that won't work, even for a mm -hmm. quasi mythicist. You know, he. Mm -hmm. So Paul uh, is very clear about that. Uh, mentions it many, many times. Certainly, that would be a theme of all of his letters. And sometimes he's sarcastic with people. He does believe, as he says to the Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians 4, when he's talking about these divisions, he says, uh, and this is very, you, know, you just have to hear the sarcasm. Oh, already you've become kings? Without us, you're already reigning? You know, like, I'm still suffering. This isn't easy for me, but... You all sound like you're the, quote, spirituals. That's a term they were, mm -hmm. some of them were using within, First Corinthians is really a great book for trying to sort these kind of issues out. Mm -hmm. Romans is more of a treatise. So in Romans 8, you get the, the overall theory and view of Paul. But in First Corinthians, you get the nitty gritty. Like, what if a guy sues me and he's wrong and he's hateful? What should I do? He said, well, let him sue you. You know, just or go to somebody in the church and try to figure it out. But, you know, don't uh, don't don't be unwilling to suffer abuse mm -hmm. because that's what it's all about. So. Yeah. Yeah. Being able to suffer well with with kindness and gentleness as opposed to anger and returning evil for evil. So um, let's transition a little bit more explicitly to Christology. So what did Paul believe about? Jesus, where, when did Jesus begin to exist? Did Jesus play some role in the creation, uh, the the Genesis creation? Is there any incarnational theory of Paul, or or is or is that sort of a later misunderstanding? How how do you understand those questions? Uh, I 
I my my view, which I've developed over the years, is, has changed some. I would say that uh, Paul believes Jesus is fully human. That is, he does not pre-exist as some angelic being. And I want to just preface that by saying that even the Logos theology of Plato and of Poimandris, two of the Greek texts that talk about the Logos, and uh, of John, the Gospel of John, that's not Jesus. When the Logos becomes flesh, you know, some people who are, I guess so-called high Christology, they, they read that as if, oh yeah, that's Jesus. He's sitting, it's not Jesus. Jesus is a human being born of a woman. So Paul says in Romans uh, 1, verse 4, that Jesus is of the flesh. He's of the seed of David. He's a human being. And he's born of a woman. So he does not pre-exist. However, in taking the position that I take, I would limit myself to Paul's seven early letters. If you go into Colossians and Ephesians and the so-called pastoral letters, you can have passages that begin in the direction that could be interpreted at least as a, a kind of pre-existent you know, Christology mm -hmm. of some type. Even then it wouldn't be Jesus it might be that the Christ spirit, as the Ebionites said, rested upon Jesus and fully inhabited him. So this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased today. I've begotten you is how they quoted the baptismal mm -hmm. saying within these uh, so-called Ebionite Judeo-Christian circles, gospel of Hebrews, gospel of the Nazarenes and so forth. Uh, but in the seven letters, which would be the Corinthian correspondence, First Thessalonians, Galatians, Philemon, Philippians, and Romans, those seven, uh, I don't think he believes in pre-existence. Now, the two passages that people often quote, actually probably three, would be one is in Second Corinthians about though he was rich, for our sake, he became poor. And you could see how somebody would say, oh, he's, Jesus is in heaven. He has yeah, rich in the heavenlies and then becomes uh, a, a poor human uh, yeah, uh, for a while. I, I really see no evidence that he thinks something like that. I think he's saying that Jesus gave up everything. Mm -hmm. And he says, and I've suffered the loss of all things too. It's that Jesus could have had a good and comfortable life. Uh, rich in Greek does not necessarily mean, uh, you Material. know, yeah. like you just have a fabulous bank account, but it's in contrast to what he did. And he's trying to get them to give money, you know, <laughs> to sacrifice. You got to read the context. He's get, he's yeah. raising a collection. So I don't see that as I'm not going to build pre-existence of Jesus before his human birth. He was a self-sacrificial person, exactly. even, even in the ultimate and final sense. And the other one is in sec, in 1 Corinthians 10, 4, the rock was Christ. Uh, the idea that, uh, well, there he's using this extended uh, kind of parable. Typology. Typology. Sort of, yeah. You know, Moses and the Red Sea and baptism. Right. Just and, as like how like Hagar, like Ishmael and Isaac exactly. can be sons. And of, even you know, uses the word allegory there. Right. You know, so there's what, the, the, what you've got to ask is what does the allegory mean? Yeah. OK. The, and he tells you, he says, OK, what fed them? They drank from a supernatural rock, so to speak, and they f were fed with manna. So they ate spiritual food and spiritual drink that came from a miracle. They crossed the Red Sea, which is like your baptism, and Moses is like Jesus. Mm -hmm. So those are the typological realities. But you don't take one of those and go, and the rock was Christ. Oh, so back there. Otherwise, Unless Moses. Christ had an impetrification before his incarnation. Well, how about yeah. he's striking Christ with a rod? Yeah. <laughs> so you got Moses beating Christ. You know, that's I hadn't a, thought of that. Any yeah. of these things can go too far. You know, people talk about, oh, let's see, we're the children of God, but we're also the bride of Christ. So does God 
does Christ marry incestuously his, his own brothers and oh wow this is getting a little crazy well of course it is because you're taking this analogy and mixing it with this one and this allegory and this metaphor and that isn't how they work each one you read individually but the the uh one that maybe would most lend itself to what you get in colossians and ephesians probably later is this idea uh it's first corinthians 8 for us, there is one God, the Father. Now, actually, you should just stop there when people say... Uh, <laughs> well, the, uh, my stuff. Unitarian self will not disagree with, <laughs> with uh, that I mean, interpretation. <laughs> did Paul think, you know, I think uh, Derek Lambert recently asked uh, James McGrath this, mm -hmm. you know, right off the bat. I remember he asked Bart Ehrman this too, and they both go, no. No, he did not think Jesus was God. If you mean <laughs> Yahweh, the eternal, the one, mm -hmm. yod heh vav -Hey, no, he's not that one. So for us, there is one God from whom are all things. Okay, that's the one. And one Lord, the Christ, Jesus Christ. A Lord is kurios. You don't mix that with the way, the Lord, the way it's translated into English and the King James and the Geneva Bible and so forth, because they don't want to put the name. This is a different word, and it's never used. It, it's it's used for so-called deities, you know, many so-called mm. lords and gods in the Hellenistic world, he says. But for us, there's only one. It means master. Uh, this is what a wife could call her husband in that culture. It's what you would call your boss. Uh, by the way, it's still used that way in Israel today. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, you know how you say to a waiter, uh, sir, sir, excuse me. Mm -hmm. That's not even your master, but you're giving respect to the person because he's entertaining the table. He's in charge of the table. Sir, could we have more water here? You know what you do in Hebrew if you're in Israel? You go, Adon, Adon. 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 Yeah. No, not Adonai. Oh, you would sorry. never yeah. say Adonai. That would be <laughs> say Adon. Adon. Mm -hmm. Or you'll see it on office doors. It'll say Adon da 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 with the person's name, like Adon Tabor. It'd be like he's, you know, he's he's the boss. <laughs> so this is how I choose. But he does say, through whom are all things. Well, they're clearly and and, and uh for who or through whom we exist, or by what what is it? It's yeah. He Some, uses a set of pronouns, yeah. Yeah, yeah. we can turn and read it if you want, or you can read it. But what he means there is, uh, I, I think he's talking about the, the new creation. In other words, the new creation, which he refers to as a creation, with the new atoms that we just talked about, that is brought in through the firstborn of, of many brothers, Jesus of Nazareth. So he's, he's talking about there's one God Genesis 1, that's not Jesus. And now there's one Lord of the cosmos who's mid been made Lord in Christ of the whole cosmos. And we also have him. But, you know, the word God is tricky. You say, well, could it be G-O-D, small letters? If you just mean a power or an entity, yes, angels are gods. Satan Genesis is the god of this gods. world. Yeah. Waiters are gods, <laughs> yeah. you know, the way I just used the yeah. term. So it just depends on what, you know, you've always got to go by the context. So I don't think there's anywhere where Paul thinks Jesus is this. Pre-existent uh, mediator of creation or like the, like God creating through the logos and sort of that kind of middle. Yeah, and even sense. if he had the view that God created through the logos or the devar, the word of God, which is, is embedded within many forms of Judaism, that wouldn't be Jesus. It would be the Ebionite view that the power of God came upon this human and he was anointed with the spirit. And as the gospel of John even says, he received the spirit without measure. Mm -hmm. So if somebody is so fully imbibed with the spirit that as the Ebionites said, the Christ spirit hastens through the ages and they believed it finally found a resting place, they call it, with Jesus. So they don't think there's a succession after Jesus because 
just as Muslims would say Muhammad's the last one, mm -hmm. and Jews would say Moses was the last one, Christians would say no, J Paul would say Jesus is the last one. There's not good. Plus, he doesn't even think there's ages and ages to go. We're at the end of the age. You don't even get married. You don't even go into business. You know, you don't make plans. You don't buy life too insurance. Far ahead. That's right. Don't <laughs> fix your teeth if you can get by with it. <laughs> Just joking. But, uh, I mean, in 1 Corinthians 7, he goes through these different states of life and says, you know, no, don't even slavery, you know, you, you know, you're, you're free in, in Christ and everybody, there's not going to be slave or free, male or female, rich or poor, Jew or Gentile, very, very shortly because the form of this world is passing away. That's what he believed. Which gets us to the big problem of Paul. None of that happened. And therefore, you've got to address that somehow and either say, well, he was wrong on the timing. It's still going to happen. Or it did happen, but it happened in some spiritual way in the heavens or something. And we are now kings ruling in Christ. And because he, in his time, would say, no, you're getting ahead of the suffering. The glorification has not come yet, other than Jesus. But he's the pioneer. He's he's run the he he's the one who paved the way, you know, and charted the course. And you're now to follow that so that at his coming, there'll be the whole mass apotheosis of, mm -hmm. of his people. Can I ask you about Philippians 2? That would be the other obvious passage where people would ask about pre-existence of Jesus, even in the um, sort of refined seven book corpus. So how, yeah. how do you, yeah. so uh, the, and I get obviously asked this question a lot is what about Philippians 2? It's, it's right there. You know, uh, he was in the form of God, then he became in the form of man and sure. now he's back where he yeah. was. Um, and I, if I said there's three passages, and I should have said there's three passages and Philippians too. Right, and the doozy. Because yeah. that, that's mm -hmm. the one that everybody goes to first. These others, there could be some agreement. Yeah, the rock was Christ. That wouldn't be as strong. But he was in the form of God. He gave it up. He came to earth. He became a man. And then he's exalted again. It's this round trip idea. That you do have in the Gospel of John, I think, although I still don't, I agree with James Dunn. I don't think Jesus is God, even in John. Uh, it's clear in John 17 that they may, know, in the prayer of Jesus, he says, I pray that they will know you, the true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. Mm -hmm. Now, Paul would like that because God sent this woman, sent him. Uh, but sent doesn't mean he took from heaven and became a man. So how would I read that? Uh, this is not my idea. Uh, James Dunn's book, I would really uh, Christology, I think it's called The Making of Christology. James Dunn, do you know that book? Yes, I know that I book. Highly um, that. And I've, I've talked to James yeah. McGrath about um, um, Christology and John, too. Sure. And McGrath study with Dunn. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, Charles Talbert is the article I would recommend. It's in my book, Paul Ascent to Paradise. I, and I go through this passage in great detail. And I would argue that it's what's called an atom Christology. I didn't originate this, but as soon as I heard it, you know how things click with you? I go, absolutely, that's it. And the idea would be that they're the first atom Garden of Eden, was told by the Nakash, sometimes called Satan, the serpent, but the Hebrew word is <clears throat> the shining one, literally. Uh, Nakash is the word for brass. It means he's shining. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the shining one told him, told them, don't eat of this particular tree because uh, in the day you eat of it, uh, you're, I'm sorry, God told them not to eat of it. I'm getting right. my terms mixed up. And the shining one said, oh, well, that's, uh, you'll be equal with God. <clears throat> so if you grasp the fruit, a thing to be grasped, and you eat it, you're going to be like gods and live forever. 
so that's the setting that Paul has in his head. Right. So this is, so Philippians 2, that's so something me, like I just a, took a drink because I <clears throat> clear my so here's the idea. The first Adam and Eve, humankind, they they wanted eternal life. So they thought they listened to the Nakash, the shining one, and they ended up dying. They're put out of the garden and they don't have access to eternal life. So it's not like they were immortal and they lost it or anything like that, or just that their bodies died. They died. They're told dust you are and to dust you will return. This is the biblical view of a human person. When you, you're, you're, you're of dust and even the breath of life, animals have the same breath of life. This idea of the of the fish, you know, the breathing life, the breathing creatures. And so what Adam one did, let's call him Adam one, he grabbed and he ended up dying. And Jesus, as the potential second Adam, did not grasp the eternal life. He didn't go the way of, you know, I'm gonna get it, but instead he took the form of a slave. And as a human, he offered himself up and gave suffering again. So it's the same thing with the suffering. And remember, he prefaces that, not with some treatise on Christology, but have this mind in you that Jesus had. It's an attitude or a mind that he's talking right. about. Right. The purpose is giving, imitation. Of yielding, of suffering. Exactly. Right. And, if you and, do and that, I can't, I can't incarnate. Be highly exalted. Right. I can't right. incarnate and myself as a lower form of being, but I right. can uh, esteem others as more important than myself and be obedient to God. Now, I know some viewers and listeners will think that's kind of a tricky exegesis. Like, no, it sounds to me like he's God and becomes human and then God again, or at least he's in the form of God. But remember, Adam and Eve are said to be in the form of God. So that didn't throw you off. But here's to me, which really, here's the thing that really convinces me. For Paul, that pattern of exaltation and glorification and if human beings in general are going to be like a pre-existent Christ, they would need to have their souls in heaven fall down to earth, and it would be a message on how to get out, you know, mm -hmm. by being obedient and suffering and so forth, and then you can be exalted like Jesus. Which so is what Origin kind of a rescue mission. Right. Origin exactly. believed something more close to he all did. the souls are he in did. heaven. People That's fall right. down, Jesus clung to God, and then Jesus right. goes on a down and up rescue mission. That's that's origins yeah. Christology, but, but that's not but Paul. I think the strength of Paul's view for individuals, and I'm not a confessing Christian. When I talk about Paul, I'm, I'm giving you what I think are his ideas. Take them or leave them. But I want to get him right. And I want to get Paul, if I want to get Paul right, I think he's what he's saying there's a correspondence to our own experience. There's, we are also atoms in the image of God. What are we going to do to, quote, get eternal life? Are we going to be obedient and sacrificial and follow the example of Jesus? Are we going to grasp at it? Well, what does 99% of humanity do? You know, what's the essential problem? Anybody would tell you human ego and selfishness seems to be the root of everything you know money is just an extent of that why do you want money self 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 so it sounds like i'm preaching here but i think you know paul was preaching <laughs> yeah. and he wants unless you can identify with the experience if somebody is a god and takes a journey down here and i don't want to belittle the idea because that would be giving up a lot and takes on human life, that's not me. Like, I, I, I don't remember being a god in heaven. And I'm, I'm just a lowly mortal human being with rotting and corrupted flesh and aging and so forth. And so I think Jesus has to be uh, the same. Otherwise, the whole 
process of salvation doesn't work uh, as I would understand it from Paul. Yeah, so that's my view. I have a I have a one quick question follow up on Philippians two. I've talked to someone else who says that that first phrase uh, in the form of God existing is actually somewhat grammatically ambiguous and could even be understood in the present tense, and that it's sort of like it starts where Jesus is now, right, as a glorified form of God being, and then backs up to tell the story of how he got there. Possibly. So like, but I, I'm more attracted to the Genesis 126. Mm -hmm. Adams and Eve are in the form of God. And the the issue is, do I eat the tree? Do I disobey? Do I go the way of ego and grasp at eternal life? Mm -hmm. Or do I listen to God? And I, I just think the pattern fits better. Sure. Uh, Greek tenses are difficult because you can use the present, but you're projecting it back as if you're telling, you know, so uh, being in the form of God, using it in the present tense doesn't necessarily mean, you know, that that's the, what the passage is about in terms of its sequence. So, but I would consider that I've never thought about it. I would mm -hmm. take a look at the Greek and think about it. So. Yeah, uh, I, I just had someone, because I actually grew up in church being taught the exact interpretation that you just laid down, the parallel and contrast yeah, with Adam. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad some people hold that view. I think it's the historians and the scholars are very familiar with it, and everybody doesn't hold it. And many who don't hold it tend to be more theological, and they're influenced a lot by the church fathers and Mm -hmm. and so forth. If you just take Paul in his own Hellenistic world, I think that idea fits very well. I think he really has his self grounded in Genesis 1, 2, and 3 very mm -hmm. strongly. And he refers to that also in other places about Eve, he mentions, and, you know, Satan tempting Eve and so forth. I mean, he's very familiar with this kind of idea. Yeah, I guess the, the last question that I'll ask you is about deification. And so we've we've sort of talked about how maybe Paul, probably Paul didn't believe Jesus was divine in the sense of being a pre-existent heavenly being who came down, whether a member of the triune Godhead or even in a more perhaps Aryan sense of that, but instead originated as a human being. But it, it certainly seems like Paul would believe in the divinity of Jesus post ascension, and Absolutely. that that it, it, it's not that he doesn't believe Jesus is divine at all, but he it's like he becomes divine or achieves divinity or gets exalted and receives divinity from God is probably the better way to say it. That's right. That's right. And it doesn't uh, confuse the person, so to speak. Um, He's not God the Father, and he never will be. And a son is not a father, and a father is not a son. Uh, you just mentioned having your new daughter. <laughs> uh, she is of you. She's not a frog or a dog or a cat or a goldfish. She's of your level of your species. And so that's the analogy that Paul uses. You know, it's birth essentially a uh, kind of being born into this new second Adam status. And that would also solve the problem where people say, well, but you can worship Jesus. Well, the English word worship is, you know, depending on what you mean, but it's essentially in Greek is the idea that you give service to or homage to or bow down to really, mm -hmm. to bend the knee, so to speak. Uh, well, yes, you can absolutely bend the knee to Jesus, and you would. Uh, but uh, the idea of worshiping an angel, uh, at least in Colossians, I think it comes up, you know, where Jewish sects were. That Don't has to do more with to getting, angels. Yeah. yeah, trying to get up the scheme of the heavens and giving reverence to this angel or that angel or making this your guardian angel. If you remember in my book, the Mithras Liturgy, the whole idea there is that you will acquire an angel or supernatural assistant as your own. Mm -hmm. And he would become your little 
deity in the heavens, you know, and he would then, when you die, he's, it says he will wrap you up and take you to the higher spheres. That kind of thing, Paul would not endorse, of course. But the idea that at the name of Jesus, as he's exalted of God, you term in English like is of uh, it's a recognition of exalted position and mortal does not have that status of corruptible and be now what happens in terms of history religions is when the parousia or the transformation doesn't come there is deep soul easy to make what I would call kind of a move to the vertical begin to talk about well the body doesn't even matter when will die their souls be immortal and they could up and be with Christ and experience this glorification and then if you try to fit that in with, well, what happens on the horizontal view at the end of the end, the dead in Christ are supposed to rise in these new bodies to meet the Lord if they're already there. Then you've got to come up with some kind of idea about souls, and then they come back to earth and join bodies or something of that nature, which Paul never dealt with. And I don't think he thought of uh, the soul could be immortal in the sense that there is an essence of the person that is preserved by God even in death. And he would probably use the term with Christ, because remember, Christ to him now has filled the whole cosmos, the from the lower to the higher. So when he talks about departing and be with being with Christ in Philippians, uh that's easy to take as, you know, every preacher that I've ever heard, they just read that at funerals and so yeah. forth. But then they go out to the cemetery and talk about burying our dear brother or sister. And on the last great day, we know he will or she will arise. And you think, well, wait, I thought, you know, they were already up with Christ. And, you know, they try to fit that together. And, of course, you can fit anything together <laughs> by just taking both positions and coming up with a way to explain it. But if you're interested in Paul and you ask Paul, what is the hope? There's no way he would say the hope is when you die, you will be immortalized and achieve the glory of the new creation. He would never say that because he's very realistic about death and about the corruption of the body and about the fact that we are not immortal atoms. We're first atoms, not second atoms yet. Whereas Jesus is the firstborn of many to come. He's the one that has been glorified, only one. But the one to him means the process is valid. In other words, the whole meaning of creation from Genesis 1 to the time of Paul has now been validated as having meaning and ultimate significance. Why? Not because souls go to heaven, because one of those atoms has now been transformed and experienced this exaltation and he believes that's going to happen to the many later right and so, so it's not just it's mm. it's not even just a deification of jesus it's a it's a open invitation to um join jesus in deification and sort yes. of the, you could almost even say the deification of the whole cosmos yeah and i know i would say i don't see anything wrong and i know this is so heretical to people that the Paul's idea is that God is reproducing himself. Now, if I say you just had a daughter, <laughs> you reproduced yourself, I'm not threatening you as the father. You're the father. Your daughter will never be the father. If anything, I'm, I'm, richer off, is of, I'm, I'm richer off on the other side of the experience. Yeah, That's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. And so, but you are of the family the same family so your daughter has all the status of your family so i know 
in as you have mentioned in Eastern Orthodox uh, theology, some of that was preserved. I don't think the whole picture that I'm presenting was preserved because they became Trinitarian and Origen particularly and Augustine, you know, deal with this a lot and they have real trouble with the bodily resurrection because they want to take the, Luke and John very literally as this resuscitated flesh and blood body. And some of them go so far as to say, no, the body of Christ in heaven is flesh. But it's, you know, you tell me because you've studied this. Uh, don't they still say that it is the real body of Jesus that was on earth in, now in heaven? Yeah. And, and one they could... say that about Mary as well. Right. She was and assumed one could... into heaven. Right, right. And seemingly, especially with Mary, seemingly without the um, glorification or, you know, something like that. Or maybe, I don't know, a Catholic could correct well, me. Well, she but... seems pretty glorified in these visions that she grants. Yeah. She seems almost exactly mm -hmm. like a Christ figure. But, you know, I've been accused of being gross and, you know, kind of offensive by talking about, you know, Jesus ascending with his internal organs, need I go further you know, and of course, the church fathers have a real problem with that because, I mean, yeah, why not? I mean, it's Jesus and he ascends to heaven. Or think of it, when you read these ancient texts, you know, they think of a body, certainly in Luke, which is really the last verse of Luke, we think is an interpolation. But if you go to Acts 1, which is the Luke Acts work, they're standing on the Mount of Olives, and there he goes. However, if you compare it to some Hellenistic ascent stories, my favorite would be Romulus. He's lecturing on the Palatine Hill in Rome, and all of a sudden he begins to rise up. But as he rises up, the earthly part melts off, and he becomes more like a star, and then he goes higher and higher, and finally you see him in the heavens glowing, mm -hmm. and that means he's become a divine being. No. And that would be very similar. Paul doesn't have that process that you're going to stand on a hill and go up, mm -hmm. but in Luke, it, it doesn't. He doesn't really clarify that. He says, "No, you're going to see him just like he left. He's going to come back like that." Mm -hmm. And, of course, John also has people touching his wounds and viewing him and eating fish and so forth. So uh, but, but I John, have a whole chapter. Yeah, in, but John does talk a lot about glory and the glorification uh, of Jesus. John uses that word glory very, very frequently. So yeah. sometimes, yeah, it, I, I guess if I were to harmonize that, I would say something like, you know, the, the spiritual body is still tactile and still yes. interactable but it is of a new category of existence that's right that can and all you can do uh and this does take us to first corinthians 15 all you can do is characterize it you can't mm -hmm. really describe it according to paul this is paul so we would use mainly terms like contrast mortal corruptible immortal incorruptible weak and you know and that means i mean we're we're very weak you know mm -hmm. you stub your toe and you feel like you're gonna die you're so weak and, you know disease gets you all kinds of things you can fall down the stairs and cripple yourself or die for life you're very weak you know we're fragile and then he says power a body mm -hmm. of power and then a, a mortal mortal subject to death back to the dust flesh and blood immortal so it's always contrast but as far as looks he says i i can't really tell you how it looks i can, but i can give you these characteristics and since he says i've seen the lord i'm going to draw the conclusion that what he saw and it, and you know you can go to the book of acts and Oh, well, it was like a bright light. Yeah, that makes sense. That could be the case. Maybe the author of Luke Acts has that tradition that it was a light and a voice. Mm -hmm. We know he gets the voice because he talks to Jesus and he receives things. 
But uh, what did he actually see? Because he says in 1 Corinthians 9 and 15, I've seen the Lord. So he's seen something as well as heard something. And I would think that he, it, it's some sort of uh, indescribable, glorified sight. But he wouldn't say, oh, yeah, he had heads and eyes and uh, just like us. And But I guess his internal organs were fairly, I don't think he would even go there. He go, I don't even know, you know, that's the body of dust. That's gone. And then when he gives the analogy of a seed and a plant, or let's, I always use the acorn and the oak tree because they're so massively different, or to take the verb he uses, metamorphosis, a caterpillar and let's say a monarch butterfly. You know, this is not this. And by looking at this, I would never see this. I would never even dream of this. So what does he say? God gives them a body appropriate to that level of existence and then he goes to the heavenly bodies as you already mentioned he goes yeah look at the sun so amazing it's appropriate to its existence in the high in the sun's actually on the way up uh you know in terms of the seven it's mm -hmm. not the highest uh so uh because you have the planets even beyond so he's thinking uh like that and i think uh so to think of it as, uh, and then he plainly says, no, flesh and blood, that would be this body, does not inherit the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Now, I do know that um, Tom Wright, Bart Ehrman, maybe all of my colleagues except for me, uh, argue the continuity between the body in the resurrection accounts in the Gospels and the glorified body in Paul. So there's there's basically a continuity. It's not like this totally new thing. And I just completely disagree with that. There's a continuity, but not with the body. The continuity is with the essential self. He says the dead will rise already glorified, you know, in the mm. in this in the state, twinkling of an eye. We yeah. are alive. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so he said, but flesh and blood. So they're no longer flesh and blood. They've gone to the dust. So his metaphor would be like Daniel 12. They sleep in the dust. So they wake up. So they still exist. But the continuity is not the what exists in the dust. That, again, is a metaphor. Those who fall in the sleeps, you sleep in the dust. And you wake up. You wake up. So you still exist. It's not non-existence. You do exist. And you especially exist in the mind and memory of God who brings you forth from the dust. But in what form? He doesn't have to go find the old body or any of its constituent parts. And I always point out that in the book of Revelation, this is really clear. For some people, pe for some reason, people have trouble with burial. I guess cremation would be a little easier. Ashes are scattered over the ocean. That doesn't need to be gathered back. But in the book of Revelation, when resurrection is mentioned or pictured, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And so death or Hades gives up its dead. Those are who are in the sea, the oceans give up. So he's thinking, no matter what states, from cremation to burial to death at sea, in no case do you need any part of the physical body. And therefore, I don't think Paul thought that Jesus's corpse needed to do anything other than experience the same change that he thinks is going to come at the end. So uh, as Dom Crossan often says, he doesn't think Paul would have any problem with the bones of Jesus because that would be what Paul calls the old clothing. You're going to get, you have present clothing, your body, you're clothed in the body. That's a body means your mode of existence. It's your vehicle for existing in the physical world. So that perishes and goes to the dust. You're now naked soul, if you want to use that term, or spirit. 
uh, I prefer spirit over soul because soul is, can also be used for animals and mm-hmm. just individuals in general in, in the Hebrew Bible, nefesh, kaya, a living being. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, so we shed the old clothes, not to be found naked, but to be reclothed. So now your essential self is reclothed, not with the old clothes. So if you wanted a humorous image, you would have this reclothed person glowing with immortality and glory and power. But I still want to carry my old clothes around. I just got kind of attached to them. I like them, you see. Well, obviously, he never conceives of that. The old clothes are gone. They're basically perished. But you haven't perished. Now, he does say, and this is shocking, that if this transformation is not coming, then those who have died have perished. Isn't that interesting? Mm. They have perished, meaning nothing will ever happen. They're not going to come forth. They're dead forever. And so that's the Epicurean view. You know, that mm-hmm. when you die, you die. And there is no, there might be a breathing kind of essence of your brain or spirit, and it just dissipates into the cosmos. So when Paul says the first Adam was of the dust, and the second Adam is a life-giving spirit, interesting phrase, a life-giving spirit, that's the deified being that has inherent immortality within itself. Mm-hmm. And has the power to your raise daughter has other people. Your inherent human life within herself, even your little baby daughter, grown mm-hmm. now, she has... She has inherent humanness in herself, even though she hasn't fully developed to what she will be later. So that's his analogy. Sure. Um, that That's that's all really good and interesting. Do you have any closing thoughts uh, before we wrap this up? No, I think that gives a good survey of it. And uh, I think uh, one, one thing you should do sometime is maybe have David Capes on. Oh, I have He's actually now, talked to David Cage. Have you had him? Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. because he could deal more with the Yahweh language Paul uses as appropriated to Jesus. But yeah, I, already, I talked with him specifically about that already. On an interview. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm going to look that up then. All right, I'll David send you the link. Good, yeah, we're real good friends. And, uh, you know, he's now, I think he's taken over the directorship of the Lanier mm-hmm. Library in Houston. You know, I think he was at Houston Baptist, and I believe that's his new position if you kept up with him. But his book, uh, you know, Paul's The Divine Christ, Christ, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, yeah, I don't know. it. The, fre- the subtitle, at least, is something about Paul's use of Yahweh language. Um, let's see. Paul, the Lord Jesus. I think that's a new version okay. of something. But his original book is this idea that he... Uh, appropriates the Yahweh language. And David was associated with Larry Hurtado and others, you know, that had the so-called early high Christology. Uh, again, just to conclude, I would say, I I would say Paul has a very high Christology only because he believes a lowly flesh and blood human being can be deified. Mm-hmm. I have, a, I have another the, friend, uh, the, who calls it a high human Christology. Exactly. So that's the key. And the problem with the Arians and Athanasius and all the debates about the Trinity, even down through the first souls, it's just, it all turns on more these philosophical categories of definition and differentiation. And that's just the problem, I think. Uh, And Paul is more... I think Paul thinks you could videotape this stuff, mm-hmm. even though we didn't have videotapes. <laughs> you know, the Lord will appear in the air and the dead will rise. And they'll, but when they rise, they'll be in these new, indescribable, glorious bodies. And then we, the living, will be transformed in the blink of an eye and we will rise to me. I mean, this is, he's not dealing with philosophical categories. He thinks this is going to happen. And that's why resurrection of the dead as Paul, I would call 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter, 
but the human formation chapter, including the dead. The living don't need resurrected for him. They're already alive. Mm -hmm. So it's not the resurrection chapter. It's the transformation chapter. Right. And then you raise your hand and go, but Paul, what about the dead? Do they get this too? That's the meaning of it. Yes, they also, let me tell you how they'll actually get it slightly before you. <laughs> you know, so don't worry about uh, in that text. And everybody forgets the context. They just start quoting it, you know, as if it doesn't have that context. So, so uh, what does Paul mean? Now, he does use the term resurrection. Like he says, Philippians uh, 3, 20 and 21, I believe it is, 19, 20, 21, are politia, commonwealth, you know, politics is in heaven, from which we await a savior. He's going to rescue you. Savior means to rescue. How's he going to rescue you? From your body of death, say, because you're just going to die. Who will will transform your lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself? That goes in also with First Corinthians 15, and we should do another show on that or another program sometime where we talk about. Is Paul a universalist? And what slight glimpses might we get beyond the parousia? Like, what does he think happens after that? He actually gives stages. Mm -hmm. And the stage we're talking about, stages we're talking about are one and two. Stage one, firstborn Jesus. Stage two, many at the parousia. What about stage three? That's called the telos. Mm -hmm. in first corinthians and nobody tends to talk much about that and he it's it's tough to get into because he doesn't tell us enough mm -hmm. but he clearly has a view of a new creation yeah that seems to be kind of similar to revelation 21 and 2 and isaiah 65 and so forth that it, it's you know, built from the first creation, but it's transformed. Second Peter as well yeah. talks about a new heaven and a new earth. So right. And uh, must God, have some view like, yeah. And God being all in all or uh, everything to everything. Yeah. And, that yeah. Is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So Paul's universalism uh, yeah. as a possibility. Well, or I have, I, even I have, if you have modified universalism meaning the vast majority you could always mm -hmm. leave room for the so-called incorrigibly wicked <laughs> but uh i have uh, for... some friends uh who are uh some of my audience will be very happy at what you just said uh i i have a minority wing of my audience that's uh hardcore universalists i would say uh so they'll be cheering that you said that um but uh i i think that would be that would be an excellent subject for yeah. a future conversation you know, and i said that Mean, meaning I'm not sure what Paul thought, but it's certainly worth discussing the different ways in which he takes those things. So, mm -hmm. All right. Well, really um, well, I thought that this was a wonderful conversation and uh, hopefully we can talk again sometime. And uh, thank you very much for being generous with your time, Dr. Tabor. Okay. Thank you.